My name is Norman Worsba, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this webinar series entitled Facing the Anthropocene. In case you are unfamiliar with the term, the Anthropocene marks this unprecedented moment when some humans become responsible for the widespread alteration of the world's land, ocean, atmospheric, and life systems. Though planetary systems and biological processes are still clearly at work, their expressions and effects can no longer be understood apart from human activity. Ranging from the cellular to the atmospheric levels, there is no place or process on Earth that does not reflect humanity's technological prowess and its economic reach. If in previous epochs, nature was presumed to dwarf and limit human power, in the Anthropocene, the situation is nearly reversed because now human ambition and power are understood to play decisive roles in shaping Earth's future. The advent of the Anthropocene compels a rethinking of multiple fundamental questions like the following. What sort of being is the human being that now exerts this outsized power? To what end should this power be directed? And how can we determine when power becomes irresponsible? Should we think of things in terms of their sacred character? How should we endeavor to build a world together? And what economic, political, and legal mechanisms do we need to get there? How should we think about hope? It is unlikely that the frames of thought that brought us to this moment are sufficient to help us imagine and implement a better future. So now is the time for us to commit to a rigorous probing of the assumptions and the commitments that have and continue to inspire our collective life. And we invite you to join in this effort. To that end, you will be invited to submit questions in the Q&A bar in the Zoom window that we will take up in the last 15 minutes of this webinar. So please be thinking about that as we proceed. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's guest, Kate Brown, who is Professor of Science, Technology and Society at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Her research interests illuminate the points where history, science, technology, biopolitics converge to create large scale disasters and modernist wastelands. She's written a number of books, including the one that I first encountered called A Biography of No Place, which is a chronicle about the lives of peasants as they lived in this border region between Poland and Russia, a place where my family itself originated. Since then, she has written several other books, including Dispatches from Dystopia, Histories of Places Not Yet Forgotten, and then most recently, her book, Manual for Survival, A Chernobyl Guide to the Future. It is my pleasure to welcome you, Kate, and I look forward to hearing from you and then also having a conversation with you. Thanks, Norm, for that introduction, and, and thanks, everyone, for, for coming out today. Um, we decided we would, Norm wanted to know, like, how did you get here? Um, and, and I often wonder that when I'm in some, you know, far out modernist wasteland, whether it's in Northern Kazakhstan or in the Chernobyl zone, I'll be sitting there sleepless at night and I'll be wondering, how did I get here? What, or what the hell am I doing here? Um, so let, let me tell you a little bit about my journey um, by you know, sharing and share a screen and give you a PowerPoint. Um, and, Sorry, I'm not seeing. Uh... How does that look? You see that? So this is the kind of um, landscape I was interested in um, 20, 20 some years ago when I started working my dissertation. And it was a landscape um, in a swampy, very poor, uh, very remote landscape at, between Ukraine and Poland. Um, it's called Polisia, um, which means that, you know, among the forest in, in Ukrainian. And um, because it was, it was very swampy and often inundated, sometimes these villages, these watery villages were um, you know, out, of, out of communication for months out of the year. And I wanted to know about them. And it was really hard to find uh, information about what's going on in these villages. Um, I, I had documents like this. This is like a population census that tells you that all these people were, you know, whether they're Ukrainian or Polish or, or Jewish or German. Um, what I did know about this area is that people spoke uh, in many different languages. Um, most of these uh, not formally educated peasants spoke in several different languages. 
Um, other sources I had were like sort of these demographic maps that the Soviets created in, in 1925. And here it you know, shows oh, there's, there's Poles over here, there's Germans over here. But you know, what, what did that mean? Um, so I kept looking you know, to find out like, you know, what, what, what would this guy tell me if he could tell me his story? And um, I realized it wasn't really a, a, a very good way to answer that question. There was some ethnographic work and um, so finally, I just started um, spending my my weekends when I was living in, in Ukraine, in small towns in Ukraine, just going out to the countryside. And what was kind of interesting at the time, this is in the mid 1990s, is I, you know, the anthropologists, the Ukrainian anthropologists and ethnographers I talked to said, "Oh, whatever you do, don't go to the village. Um, there's just a bunch of drunks there. It's hard to get there. When you're there, it's very uncomfortable. There's flies and outhouses. Just better to stay in Kiev and read about." The village. Um, I ignored that advice and I started, uh, you know, hitchhiking. There was no bus or train service because the economy had imploded, but I started hitchhiking around and often um, I would just get a ride with somebody with a horse and a cart. Um, and as I went through these villages, I realized all kinds of things about what the documents said didn't make any sense, like that you could not discreetly segregate people as Poles or Belarusians, Ukrainians, Germans, Jews, that they were all mixed up, that they didn't see themselves in, in that way at all. Um, so I, 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 th with those insights, I, I went deeper um, and I wrote this biography of No Place. And the end of the book concludes with um, a little epigraph, epilogue about the Chernobyl zone because um, it's about the depopulation of this densely populated multi-ethnic borderland over about 25 years. And the final um, step in that was um, in the center of that area was the what became the Chernobyl zone, which was fully depopulated. And I thought that was a pretty interesting um, sort of lesson about what happens in the wake of progress and modernity. Um, and if you look to the margins to these, you know, so these backward places, what you see is a lot of destruction that progress leaves in its wake. Um, so I went to the Chernobyl Zone in 2004 when it first opened for tourism and I wrote um, an article about it. And that was the first year, that was the year I published a biography of No Place. And an editor asked me to write a book about uh, Chernobyl as a pivotal mo moment in history. And I, I thought, ah, at the time I thought, oh, there's so much about Chernobyl. I, I don't want to write a, a book about that. But I, I realized there was a couple of places that had spilled yet more uh, radioactive waste than Chernobyl. And those were the first two places in the world to produce plutonium. And so I wrote this book called Plutopia. And this is the um, uh, plutonium plant in Eastern Washington state um, on the Columbia River called the Hanford plant. And, um, and you can, I think you can see from this photograph that I start to tune into the fact that you know that instead of Merry Christmas here, you could, you could almost have a sign that says Arbeit macht frei that you know, this kind of architecture and these kind of spaces were not particularly American, that they, were, they shared a lot with um, uh, architectural um, uh, sort of language across cultures. And that made me think, you know, if I just wrote about the Soviet, you know, if I stayed in my discipline, I just wrote about the Soviet plutonium plant, um, maybe I wasn't getting a good part of the story. So I decided to put these two plutonium plants together um, and as I as I worked this story, I um, I also you know went to these places, spent a lot of time there, and this was sort of the the mothballed first um, industrial production reactor, the B reactor that produced the first uh, softball sized orb of plutonium that was the the center of the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki, and you can see in the forefront here these 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 rusted cans and the sort of um, gravel pad. Uh, this Hanford site is now the country's largest Superfund site. Um, it's just it's just caked, saturated with um, at least 350 million curies of radioactive waste, and that that's just an awful lot of waste. That's um, almost double what was what, uh, you know left in the, the Chernobyl explosions, um, and uh, I found similar estimates of radioactive waste outside of the, the Mayak plant in, in Siberia where the Soviets made plutonium. And this is the Tietje River. Um, in 1949, the Soviets ran out of underground um, waste storage tanks. And so they had two options. One was to stop production of plutonium until they could build more 
underground plant, uh, underground storage tanks. But the other option was to dump it in this little turgid river. And they did that because they felt like they needed to build a, a nuclear shield to defend against American bombs. So for three years, um, three million curies of radioactive, high level radioactive waste was dumped into this river and nobody downstream of the 28,000 people who were farmers who lived there um, were told about this. Um, and, so, and so as I worked the story, I, I, I started to realize that, that, that the scientists talked about radioactivity as something that was almost alive. It was so dynamic, it showed up everywhere. The inside of plants um, from uh, onto clothes, onto the bottoms of shoes, into workers' houses, um, and definitely into the environment, especially as they, the, the means to deposit, dispose of radioactive waste was to dump it into the rivers, put it in smokestacks up in the air, or bury it in the ground. Um, even though this is a state of the art, um, new technologies to produce plutonium, they use really old fashioned means to dispose of the waste. Um, and so there's, you know, I, you see this migration of this, these radioactive isotopes into the bodies of animals that they are tested here. They're working with a, a pig uh, at the Hanford labs. Um, and here they're looking at uh, a worker's body. Um, and so I became aware, I think, of, of a different kind of communication or media that the, that the environment itself and, and radioactivity, we can't, we, we can't sense it. We can't touch or feel or, or smell or see it. But um, uh, detectors um, pick it up quite easily. And you can start to see the connections um, that radiation sort of binds the world together in really interesting ways. And, 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 and many of these first post-war researchers who started working with radiation in environments like the Odin brothers started to conceive of an ecosystem um, because they could detect, they could put a little bit of cesium in a, in a tree in a Savannah, uh, Georgia forest and see it go within a couple of weeks all over the place, um, again, as, as if it were alive. So I um, was at first just interested in sort of more cultural uh, stories about these plutonium um, plants, these plutopia towns that I wrote about. But then I started to meet these farmers in, in both uh, the United States and the West and uh, out in Siberia who were telling me very similar stories about medical problems they said that were related to their exposures to radiation. And so I, I started um, you know, skating around those landscapes as well. Here I am again, back with farmers. Here's a family. Um, I'm, there's a younger version of me um, trying nervously not to eat that um, freshly uh, made meal of veal and goose and cucumbers and tomatoes, all that were produced right out the back door. Uh, behind me is the boy Kareem, uh, who had a vocabulary of about 60 words. And, and he was what the father said, this is Nash Luchevik, our, our radiant one. Um, and he said every, every family in this village on this Tiecha River has, has at least one radiant you know, child. Um, here's the meal that we ate, and, uh, a close-up of, of um, Kareem. Um, so I, I became, I think aware of, of something, this is really before I, I, I became aware of the concept of the Anthropocene, but I became aware of the huge impact, especially in these more immediate environments around these um, radiative, radiative sites about how strong the impact of human invention was on uh, the environment and on the bodies of the people who, um, live there, you know, for Kareem, what it means to be human is it, it, quite different after 1945 than before 1945. Um, I follow the, uh, you know, the crusading lawyer on the left here, Nadezhda Kutepova, and, um, and the sort of survivors, and this, the woman on the right, Gulnar is no longer alive. She died of cancer a couple of years ago, as they tried to um, substantiate this this record of, um, of, of radioactivity that landed in their bodies as they tried to, to dig up records, to um, use radiation detectors, to use legal means and, um, and uh, uh, understandings of ecosystems and ecologies to try to get this story and make it concrete and manifest in court. Um, and so, you know, you, you know, you see the sort of measuring the products and bodies. So that was this book, Plutopia. Um, 
and this is a school uh, out in Siberia, in the plutonium town of Azurisk, where um, uh, a, a large number of kids, um, uh, I, you know, 900 kids have um, disabilities in this pretty small town of 50,000. Um, and that br brought me to the, again, to the Chernobyl story. I wanted to know, I felt like I hadn't really gotten the medical story, that I hadn't made a case very strongly, though I, I had a pretty strong inclination that um, these farmers who often didn't have more than a high school education um, knew a lot about uh, nuclear medicine and they knew a lot about their bodies and the ecologies they lived in and that their um, their hunch that they had been poisoned and that their health problems that were chronic were from uh, the radioactivity that had been spewed from those plants, I thought was quite apt, correct. And so I, I thought, well, maybe, you know, Chernobyl happened later it was a civilian site, not a military site. Maybe there'll be more records. And so I went first to Ukraine, and then to Belarus, and then to uh, a couple of different sites throughout Europe and, and North America to get the international um, uh, records of, of Chernobyl, the assessments of the environmental and the medical impacts of Chernobyl accident. And um, there too, I mean, it was just, um, we, we had just, a, I worked with two um, collaborators, um, one in Ukraine, one in Belarus, and uh, we really hit the Klondike of records that, uh, you know, just showed a tremendous impact right here. You see, um, that's where the Chernobyl zone is, is where my arrow is here. Um, a couple of days after the accident, uh, pylons went up because a big storm front was, um, was brewing right over the Chernobyl plant. It was gonna bring storm clouds um, with a lot of precipitation to the big Russian cities of uh, Yaroslav, Voronezh, and Moscow. So pilots went up and they seeded the clouds to make it rain past the big city of Gomel in this rural area right here. Um, about 280,000 farmers lived in southern Mogilev province. Um, and you can see from this map that levels of radioactivity are nearly as high as right next to the plant in this second Chernobyl zone, one that few tourists visit uh, or journalists. Um, but because they didn't tell anyone that they, in Belarus that they had done this, not even the leader of the Belarusian Communist Party, um, nobody, th this area was depopulated within a couple of weeks after the accident. This area wasn't fully depopulated until 1999. Um, and so I worked my way through the Ministry of Health Records and the Ministry of Agriculture Records, and I saw um, a pattern of contamination that um, radiation from Chernobyl got into um, the food supply through you know, livestock in the fields, crops in the fields, and worked its way up the food chain towards humans. Um, you know, I found you know, really confusing records that, that, that in this wool plant in a pretty clean town that didn't get hit with um, fallout from Chernobyl, Chernihiv, about 50 miles away from the plant, that there was 200 women who were given status as liquidators. That meant that they had um, Got, had documented exposures and had contributed to the cleanup of the accident. And I was like, well, how could textile workers in a clean town 50 miles away be given liquidator status? I thought that was only the firemen and the soldiers. So I went to this factory and I talked to the managers and they said, you know, um, yeah, we had a problem in 1986 with some radioactive wool, but we changed our process and <clears throat> problem solved. I went down on the floor, the factory floor, and I met 10 of the women um, who were still around. Um, I said, where's everybody else? As they picked their name, names out of the list that I had. And they said, oh, they've all either died or, or they've been invalided out on pensions. And, and these women were, were pretty amazing. They had, again, they didn't even have a high school education, but they had a pretty good understanding of, um, of radiobiology. And they pointed to different parts of their bodies that ached or were diseased and they could tell me accurately which radioactive isotopes had lodged in which organs to cause their problems. They also asked me, they said, sure, we got our, the, the wool pretty clean when we changed our process, but what do you think happened to the wastewater that came out of the plant? And I said, I don't know what happened. They said, it went into the drinking reservoir. I asked the managers, they said, no, that's impossible. But I went and, and went through the archives and sure enough, these women were right. Um, and so I learned over the years that um, there's all kinds of people who are experts. Uh, there are scientists, there are, are medical doctors, um, and there are also the people who have had to um, experience tragedy and trauma and the impact of the Anthropocene on their bodies themselves. And for them, 
um, their bodies become these very modern, modernist you know, wastelands or landscapes, um, which makes living that much harder. So uh, Soviet heads, you know, socialized medicine, they had sort of a natural um, epidemiological uh, system reports that came in every, every six months. This one is showing is a study that looked at um, children between the ages of four and six who had anemia from 1986 to 1989. And you see this just an arrow shooting up into the sky. Um, so I started, you know, getting, you know, how did this radioactivity spread around this absolutely gorgeous landscape? The Chernobyl zone was in the Europe's largest swamp, the Pripyat marshes, and it's a, the sandy bowl of terrain was intersected by 17 rivers and with hundreds of streams and lakes. And so I, I started, um, get, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what was it about this landscape that so um, made radioactivity so dynamic? And I worked with these, uh, followed as a participant observer, these two fantastic biologists who've been working in the Chernobyl zone uh, since 2000. They go twice a year. And we went to some pretty ugly forests. These are mutated pine trees that are trying to become pine trees, but they only manage to be shrubs. Um, I noticed there are some thousands of, of blueberry pickers after 2014 when the Ukraine joined the European Association Agreement and they had the right to sell produce to the European Union. And so there was this industrial picking of wild uh, blueberries from the Pripyat marshes. And um, so I went undercover blueberry picking myself and, and I ended up at the wholesalers. And, and here's a woman who was um, buying the berries, but she first you know, measured every, uh, box of blueberries that came in and I and I asked her you know how many of these blueberries are, are radioactive and she said all the blueberries are radioactive and some are just really radioactive like 3,000 becquerels a kilogram the Ukrainian norm at the time was 450 becquerels a kilogram and we stood around um, I watched her um, as she um, bought the berries and I noticed that she bought all the berries whether they were over the permissible norm or under, and I uh, asked, well, what are you gonna do with all those berries that are too too dirty? And the pickers told me, and they were like, well, they're like, it's like the, the Soviets did with the sausage. They mix the cleaner berries with the dirtier berries, and they get to the European norm, which was uh, 1,250 becquerels a kilogram, and then they can sell them abroad. Um, I tracked these berries uh, going across the Canadian into the US. So these, these berries come a little bit closer to home. We have a uh, a nuclear, a localized nuclear accident that occurred in Ukraine. It seems like a long way off, but those radioactive blueberries can show up on our breakfast plates. Um, so that is, um, those are the, those are the depressing stories I've been working on in the last 20 years. Um, but now I'm interested in, you know, how do we fix these situations? How do we get to a place where we don't have to create more modernist wastelands. In fact, how can we create places of, of plenty that uh, where we sustainably live? And I've gotten interested, you know, we've all been grounded the last year and I've gotten interested in a neighborhood in DC where I live called Deanwood, which was always, it was founded as an African-American neighborhood in the 1880s. And here's a picture of Deanwood in 1947. As you see, there's no infrastructure. Uh, there's no running water uh, to the houses. There's no sewer system. There's no roads. There's no pavement. And that was actually, and there's no garbage collection. And that was actually really good because what it meant is that these people who lived in this neighborhood all had gardens um, and they, they didn't have any garbage pickup. So they composted their waste. They had pigs running around who ate um, both um, human waste and um, uh, you know, food scraps. So they had a lot of chickens. Um, and they had really fertile gardens. And what I find with, what's so amazing about this neighborhood of um, African-Americans in the first half of the 20th century is that they had some of the highest rates of homeowner um, occupancy in the, in the city, um, nearly as high as the really wealthy neighborhoods where the senators uh, lived in DC. And from the best I can figure out, that was because in these neighborhoods, people uh, were feeding themselves. And they actually, on their small plots of land, about a tenth to uh, a quarter of an acre, they were able to grow enough to sell some in carts, you know, off to their, um, in other neighborhoods of DC. And that bought them a lot of financial security. It bought them um, uh, flexibility in their work. And, and because they were on the lowest uh, edges of the um, employment structure, when they were out of work, they could still feed themselves and, and get some, some money. 
I find a similar pattern um, in the Soviet Union in the 1990s. I was um, in the Soviet Union. The economy had collapsed. The country had collapsed. Um, collective farms were producing half of what they had produced in the 1980s. In the 1980s, it was already hungry. So everybody was talking about a famine. We're going to starve. We're sitting here and we're going to starve. Uh, but they didn't starve. And that's sort of a story that um, you know a few uh, people of, of, of economists have debated, but we should pay more attention to. The same thing happened in Cuba when they uh, didn't, no longer had uh, Soviet subsidies and America, another American embargo came on them. They started growing their own food right in the cities, right outside of the cities in peri-urban areas. And um, by the 1996, 91% of all potatoes grown in Russia, and that potatoes is a major staple, were grown on these little private plots that just people went out and, and grew their own potatoes on 1.5% uh, of the arable land in the country. And, and you know, I think this is um, a, a sort of fantastic thing. I mean, we have, we're looking at, at cities in America where, uh, and all around the world, where we're not gonna be able to have cars. Uh, cars are not gonna make sense. They're these big gas guzzling vehicles that um, we are not gonna be able to afford to have. Um, because of climate change and, and a host of other reasons. And we dedicate 30 to 50% of our suburban territories to, we devote them to cars, to parking them and to moving cars around. We're not gonna need that space anymore. So we could have all this new green space opening up in cities. Um, and with that, we could have uh, more equity, uh, more sustainability, uh, better diets, healthier food. We'd have our hands in the ground so that we could join our lives uh, with the microbial world around us, which would make our, um, our bodies healthier, restore um, both the you know, 36 million Americans right now experience food uh, security issues. More than half of Americans have diet related health problems. Um, these are, and, and what we see is a, 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 the seventh great extinction is the lack of microbial diversity in the human gut in the Northern hemisphere in industrialized nations. Um, this project to self-provision cities, um, and, and here this, this is Baltimore right now, uh, could go a long way towards um, restoring some balance and health and equity in our society. All right, Kate, this is just great. Uh, what I want to remind webinar participants is that you can put questions in the Q&A uh, tab so that we can get to them later on. There, there's so many themes that you bring up in your presentation that I'd, I'd love to explore and also just get into some of the terrain of your, your books too, because what you're doing is I think so crucially important for the way we narrate our histories, the way we narrate what's happening right now and also how we might position ourselves for the future. So when you take us to the margins and you invite us to listen to people who are traditionally not listened to, and when you talk about how architecture speaks, I love how you use that phrase, that the land in a sense is a kind of witness to the brutalities of progress and not just the successes of the march of progress. How do you think this changes the way we think about what even history is? Do we need to radically reevaluate history because for the most part, peasants' voices have been absent and, and the damage done to landscapes has been concealed from view. So what we think about our past, what we think about success, historically speaking, may all be a big deception. Do you think that's right? Well, I don't know if it's a big deception, but there's a lot of missing, there's a lot of gaps in the record. And I think anybody who studies people who were marginalized in the past um, historians are really frustrated you know, if you're a historian of, of the African-American past, uh, of the African past, of, of peasant groups all over the world, they, they're not given a voice. And, and if there is a voice that's mediated through some expert, some outsider who's interpreting for them and who's um, editing them. Uh, so it's hard to get sort of, you know, you know does the subaltern speak? Um, often no. But now, you know, we don't have to rely just on text, texts that were created by elites um, and uh, other elites decided which texts to keep and, and, and where to store them and, and, and which, which texts to throw out, which incriminating documents might better be thrown in the waste bin. Like all of those things, 
we can get around. I, I teach a course at MIT called Forensic History, where we're we're using the tools of uh, you know paleoarchaeology um, and paleobiologists who can take a core sample or look at you know the the, the body of a of a guy who died you know in 2000 um, BC and figure out what he had for breakfast. And what he had, his last three meals, they, they were able to figure out with this guy Uzi in, in Austria and, and Italy. But we can do that for the modern period too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things I would have loved to have done uh, had I thought of it in time for this Chernobyl program was just go out to the, to the villages that were depopulated and find the spots where the old outhouses were and take a core sample and figure out, you know, how much radiation was in their um, feces samples. You know, people who work, uh, you know, microbiologists would have, you know, quickly been able to do that. Um, we can look at, uh, you know, in these neighborhoods. I'm, I'm having trouble um, in these right here in D.C. It's it's two three miles away. It's not in the distant past, but I'm having trouble recapturing the annual plant, the squash and the corn and the beans that these people in Deanwood grew. There's not really a record of them. There there are agricultural senses of cities at this time but they don't go into the detail um, that I want. But one way to get to that story, and, and, and you can also especially find it too with, with uh, animals, is go down into the old mizens and go into the local garbage dumps and, 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 and see what's there in terms of pollen samples, uh, bones, um, other kind of debris that's left behind. We can learn a lot from that. Um, so I, I, you know, I, that's my challenge for my students in the class is how can we get at these stories? Um, outside of the text. And so therefore, you know, skirt some of the power structures that, that so, created text in the first place. Yeah, that's really great about the, the lost knowledge that we have. Let's talk a little bit about the contested knowledges that we have. So for instance, in your presentation, you, you remarked about going to this plant and these women gave a version of what had been going on that was quite different than the managers because managers have quotas to fulfill and so forth. And so there's the official bureaucratic story about what happens, but then there's also the people who are on the ground who are feeling the effects of bureaucratic planning in their bodies. And so we've got not just lost knowledge, but we've got contested knowledge. So how, how do we think about this? Because we're operating, and, as, and I think what, what I love about your work is that you're very good at drawing analogies between the system that we saw develop in the Soviet Union, but also as it developed in America. So you make the point about how Nevada with its radiation testing produced it three times the fallout that Chernobyl did. And yet we're not talking about this and we're not able to, to appreciate how destructive this has been to the American landscape, to American communities at the same time. So there's obviously official stories that we wanna tell ourselves, but then there are these unofficial embodied forms of knowledge how do you navigate that with your students when you talk to them about how you do historical writing or just more generally even journalistic types of reporting? Yeah, I mean, you know, what you're saying, Norm, about contested knowledge is, is of course, huge when we come to um, the effects of, of radioactive contaminants in the, in, in the environment that, and then into bodies. Um, the official UN count for uh, fatalities from Chernobyl is 33 to 54 people dead. Uh, that's a really low number. If anybody spent any time circling the Chernobyl zone in these communities, um, you will, you know, within a couple of weeks, you'll meet 54 people who will tell you about 54 family members who have died from what they say are, are Chernobyl causes. Um, so that number is clearly very low, but that's the official number. That's the number until recently, the New York Times or the Washington Post would quote as the, as the you know, citationable because experts said it. Um, what I was able to do is, is, is because I have the, the great privilege of being a, a scholar in a, in a Western institution and the great privilege of having had some grants, I could go to a lot of different archives and, and sort of taking the clue, taking cues from these, these villagers and, and these, these workers um, and believing them and saying, okay, so how do I substantiate their story? And so I went through 27 archives with the help of, of, of two collaborators. And we found that, you know, um, you could see clearly that the consultants working for the UN were also consultants working for other new nuclear agencies. There were very few independent scientists who were not 
I'm also getting a, a salary from some nuclear agency um, or you know a nuclear power plant. Um, and so these guys had um, had all kinds of reasons um, institutionally why they would want to help Moscow leaders minimize the impact of the disaster. Big lawsuits, um, and this is where Chernobyl gets connected to the American landscape. Big lawsuits were coming down the pike at the end of the Cold War, as um, archives opened up. Uh, no longer, you know, no longer Cold War. No longer have to have such secrecy. And Americans started to learn the extent of uh, spread of radioactivity on the American uh, continent. Um, and everybody else tested nuclear weapons in somebody else's territory. You know, the Soviets in Kazakhstan or the Arctic, the the French in um, in Algeria and the South Pacific, the British in Australia, the South Pacific, but the Americans tested in the South Pacific, but also in Nevada and New Mexico. The first Trinity site test was devastating in terms of, of the radiation it spread. They really didn't know what they were doing with that test. Um, and so as these lawsuits came on, um, the they were scrambling. They were, they were just freaked out. The Department of Energy met with um, the whole American Association of Health Physicists in 1987 and said the biggest threat to nuclear power right now is not um, another accident, it's lawsuits. And so they brought in Department of Justice lawyers to train American health physicists how to become expert witnesses on behalf of the US government to, um, to make a case to say, you know, Chernobyl, world's worst nuclear accident, only 54 people died. Therefore, this, this you know, uh, radioactive fallout from the tests um, is not to be worried about. And, and that was really effective. Mm. That was a really effective narrative that we need to revisit now. Yeah. You describe yourself as a professional disaster tourist, right? And that position obviously has given you some real insight into the making and the unmaking of places. So I'm interested to hear from you now that as we're in, well, we're in this Anthropocene epic where we're seriously having to consider making and unmaking of places. And you, you alluded to this a little bit at the end of your presentation. Do you have something like a recipe for good making of places as opposed to all the unmaking that you've seen? I know you, you were hinting at this a little bit, but what, what are some of the things that you think we need to be attending to in a more general sense about what we need to do to set ourselves up to cook a good place. Yeah. Well, I think we've seen, uh, we've got lots and lots and lots of examples of what happens when economies are run on the notion of endless growth, uh, self-interest, um, competition, survival of the fittest. We no longer, this, the we, human societies um, are often um, elaborated on models of our understanding of human understandings of nature. We no longer believe that um, organisms out in nature are competing with each other and fighting with each other. We now understand that they're collaborating, that in fact, it's very difficult to distinguish a tree as its separate organism for the entire Forests. We're now starting to think of forests as one large organism. We're no longer able to say that this that, that you, Norm, are a, an individual. Um, we now know that you, that about ninety percent of the DNA in your body is from parasites, from microbial um, uh, matter, some of which we call dark matter. We don't even know what it is, but we know that it's either commensal or actually beneficial. And very few of those microbes cause disease or pathogens, like one percent. Um, we know now because of the pandemic that, that the air is a medium of communication and it's bringing to us all kinds of things, um, the virus and other, you know, bad bacteria, but also a lot of good things. Um, and so we're starting to understand that the, um, that we can't, we can no longer organize our societies based on old, old fashioned 19th century science that we now find to be wrong. So instead of thinking of, of separate entities, private property, bounded, bounded nations, I think we need to think in terms of commons, in terms of cooperation, um, in terms of um, the unbounded qualities, the whole of the biont qualities of the, of, of the human as an extended organism. Mm -hmm. That once we do a little bit of damage to the tree right outside my window, that's going to rebound back in my body on, on my house. 
because there's, there isn't a way to separate that. So the one experiment I'm carrying out right now, since since I've been here um, in DC pretty much nonstop for the last year, is uh, I started gardening. I don't have any place to garden. That I don't have any private property to garden. So um, my friend, my 28 year old friend and I, who lives next door, we started gardening everywhere around the neighborhood, um, trying to build a, an edible forest. And we, we um, propagated uh, fig and persimmons and pawpaw trees. Um, local, we try to get native um, ground covers, asparagus and, and strawberries. And um, what's interesting is we don't really have permission to do this, but nobody has stopped us. Uh, nobody's, very few people have even asked questions because I think that we don't have much in the way of um, a vegetable vocabulary, a botan botanical vocabulary. So a green, one green thing is like every other green thing. Um, the people, we, we started to put up a few little tiny bamboo fences to keep the dogs from peeing on the strawberries. And then people noticed a hardscape, you know, was noticeable. Um, but so in doing that, I've, I've, under, I've come to know my neighbors better. I've come to know the neighborhood better. I've come to know the, the, the homeless two guys who live on the street in front of me. Um, and I've started to, to recalibrate uh, what I what I mean by community. Um, so, I mean, this is this is fascinating because you're talking about your embodied immersion into a neighborhood, which is revealing things to us. That's so important for us to know. For instance, in your in your writing, you talk about how accidents don't just happen, right? You describe Chernobyl not as an event that happened, but an intensification of a whole line of history. Right, that has been prepared before and will continue thereafter. So clearly the, the issue is that we claim to know that something terrible has happened, but we're not able to learn from it. So it's a kind of suspect knowledge, you might say. Do you think the kind of embodied knowledge that you're talking about in say urban gardening or the embodied knowledge that you've learned to, to pay attention to from peasant or marginalized peoples, how is that knowledge different and how might it prepare us better for the kind of work that we need to go ahead because we, we, we live in a world that is utterly saturated with information and data, but it seems not to be doing the work we need it to do at this precise moment, which is to build communities, to build neighborhoods, to build regions and habitats, infrastructures that are sustainable, that are not just gonna keep us going, but might actually make life beautiful or fragrant or delicious or whatever language you wanna use. Well, you know, so what is embodied knowledge? Um, you know, we have all these invisible toxins. Um, they could be heavy metals in the soil. They could be plastics, um, uh, different kinds of chemical contaminants or radioactive contaminants. They're, they're all around us. We can't really sense them or see them, but we're nervous about them. Um, but when you work with living things, they, are, they be can become our barometers or our Geiger counters in a way, um, are, they can become the sensitive devices that, that um, engineers create, but we don't necessarily know how to run or calibrate ourselves. So, you know, the, the peasants in, around Chernobyl said, yeah, I knew something was up because my cow was acting funny on that day that the accident went. Now you could say, oh, that's an old wives tale, but you can also say, well, wait a minute, this person has a really intimate knowledge of their cow. They've been living and working with cows for 80 years in the case of this old woman's life on I me. Mean, of course she would notice a difference, just as I noticed that in one spot my strawberries grow really well and another spot that's poorly drained and uh, has some other problems that my, my strawberries aren't gonna grow. And so we start to, as we interact with our environments, um, we become more attuned and, and we attune ourselves to those environments, we become better adapted so one of the questions, and, and I know that you've thought about this a lot, Norm, is, and, and having grown up on a farm yourself and having farmers for, for, for relatives, is that we have gotten farming, since the 19th century, we've gotten farming all wrong. We've just gone off a left field of farming. We keep making the same mistakes, colossal mistakes. So now that, you know, they're talking about peak soil. Um, we don't have to worry about peak oil, but we have to worry about peak soil now and peak water. We're pouring water. Um, and, and we're pouring fungicides and pesticides um, into crops that we that are in, increasingly not sustainable. Where, and we have these farmers who are saying things like, the, you know, the, the you know the big farm representatives. Well, how else are we going to feed nine billion people? 
And I think that's the hubris of, of that, that phrase alone is the hubris of the modernist moment, that, that a few individuals take it upon themselves to feed the entire globe. Nobody asks them to do that. In fact, if you look at the statistics, still to even to this day, most farming comes from smallholders who grow in little bits of, of, of food like my friend and I are growing outside the door. Mm -hmm. um, that that is, and has long been a far more sustainable option. It's also a difficult one, right? So that on the one hand, we can talk about the benefits of embodied engagement with non-human organisms, plants, animals, insects, and so forth. And the danger, of course, is to romanticize that. But it, we're not talking about going back to a world in which everybody's a peasant, everybody's growing all their own food, which would be enormous, very difficult, very humiliating, because the first thing you realize when you try to grow something is how little you know and how little you how little power you have but that seems to me to be an absolutely crucial insight because what you see in so many of the modernist schemes is this illusion that not just power but the ever greater intensification of power overcomes every problem and what you're helping us understand is that no it's the wrong kind of power it's the wrong stance before power that we need to be taking into account here because when you're when you're trying to grow food, it's it's a humbling experience. And do you think that we are preparing each other very well to live on this planet with a greater dose of humility than the kind of arrogance that has brought us to this Anthropocene moment? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a really you, you frame it so well um, in that when we come to a place where we understand um, just on a really micro level. It, the, the place where we live, uh, the people we live with and the other organisms we live with, it is a humbling experience. And it's also, um, whatever the opposite word is from alienating experience, it, it's an experience that brings us, um, I think, more satisfaction. I mean, I, I, there's a lot, we have a lot of problems with our modern world and, and one is a, a, a increasing sense of anxiety, um, increasing sense of the problems are too big and, and we're just passively, you know, these little little plastic balls bobbing on a vast ocean, we're unable to, to fix this. Um, so one, one, way, one form of engagement is just to, to, to really, to just do, just to go and, and be and to, and to figure out what is this connection that is so vital uh, to our world, which is between ourselves and food? And I, and I do think that if we um, were to rethink cities um, where instead of having to have a, a parking spot or a garage for every bedroom in an apartment, like they do in California, that you had to have a, a plot of land um, and for, you know, in a commons created around that. That um, you know, we found the problem at, with the beginning of the pandemic was with long supply lines. We weren't getting our apples from New Zealand anymore. Um, farmers here couldn't sell all their chickens, so they're slaughtering billions of animals needlessly. Um, that if we brought our, um, our the things that we most rely on closer to us um, and produce them ourselves, some of them. I mean, of course, like, you know, during World War II, Americans produced 40% of their fruits and vegetables in victory gardens, just little tiny plots. It, nobody thought they could do it. And in fact, they did. You know, the big, the, the big cereal still came from somewhere else, still came from far away. But the things that we need, that we need fresh and that are hardest to move were right there in our communities. Um, I don't know, I feel like that, Somehow, I think that that would help us get a grasp on, um, on not on sort of endless consumption, but would still allow us to grow and thrive. Yeah. So one of the questions from the participants is, how, sh how do we think about land? How do we think about ownership, given what you've just been saying about, say, the commons? You know, we've got conceptions of the commons that existed prior to industrialization. Uh, prior to wide scale privatization of land. But we're on this side now of privatization. And we're in a time in particular where privatization is like at an absolute level where people have license to do with their land, whatever it is they want, keep people out and so forth. How do you help people think about a commons, you know, given the work that you've done on the histories of land management and so forth? 
Well, I mean, think about the commons. It, it was created, um, the, the enclosures, you know, starting, you know, three centuries ago were, were created in order to force people to go engage in, in underpaid wage labor, uh, making sure people did not have subsistence forms of, of, of living, that they didn't have something to fall back on, meant that they would take any factory job, no matter how miserable it was, um, and no matter how poorly they, you know, nutrients they were fed. And that you know, created a cycle of producing cash crops that were you know, not very nutritious, but were addictive. Uh, you know, sugars and tobaccos and opiates and um, what's the other big one I'm missing, but um, producing these things. Now we produce a lot of corn syrup and a lot of um, fatty meat that that isn't very good for us, but but is quite addictive. Um, these kinds of things um, force people into the kind of wage labor straits. Now we talk a lot about precarious labor um, and the obsolescence of secure, you know, salaried jobs. Um, so it's a good time, I think, to rethink private property. Like e even farmers don't grow their own food. Um, you know, the um, you know sharecroppers in the South by the 1960s, you know, they're growing cotton right up to the doors of the shacks, um, um, so that people didn't even have what they had always had, even when they were enslaved, which was their own little kitchen garden. Um, I, I think that's all, you know, a, a sign of a of an institution that was created um, really to to force the working class to work on the terms of the people who commanded the property. Mm. So another question from a participant is: How do we use our universities to retool human civilization on the scale to make our planet sustainable? A very small question. Yeah. I think first of all, we ask our um, we ask what we can do, and we ask what our administrators can do to make it education more affordable, more flexible, uh, more equitable. Um, more and more, um, in, in my sh lifetime, which is increasingly not so short, I've seen campuses, whether they're public or private, um, become more like country clubs, um, you know, with all kinds of fancy this and that. Uh, when all they really need, and, and, and we're having an educational experience right now, um, we don't need much to do this, um, we know. And so I think we need to dial back down and we have to ask our administrators and, and maybe that means we ourselves have to take pay cuts and have less perks. Um, I think we need to relocalize our, our research. Um, we, I think, in, you know, in my case, it's um, rather than me zooming around um, with my passport and research funds that amount to a great deal of privilege, that I should be um, more and more seeking collaborations with people in other parts of the world um, in order to, um, for all, us to lean on our, our local expertise wherever they are um, and to bring other opportunities from other parts of the world. Yeah, no, I like that. I, I remember a few years ago, I had a conversation with Wendell Berry about what an Anthropocene university would look like. And he of course hated the term, but when we got past that, he said, we really need to try to find ways to make education place-based education, which means that we've got a, a focus of a curriculum on a particular region where the people who are studying are located so that they can invite in area residents to help us understand what the problems are, mm. what solutions are available and to hand, how do we work together to, to revitalize economies or to produce healthy food or to make sure we have a good healthcare system, right? So the kind of localizing takes us with a different focus because so much education is often about the exotic, the far away or something like that. And it's a repositioning then of students, I think at the same time. Yeah. Another question from a participant, to what degree do you find the language of sustainability helpful? Is there something better than the language of sustainability that we need to be using? Yeah, there probably is. There probably is, and and I don't, I don't necessarily have that word. Um, I think we need to be thinking, really, in terms of extended organisms. Um, that my body doesn't end with what looks like my skin, um, and that once I once I realize that my body is extended, you know, through the very air in which I am you know, continually breathing in and out and that my skin is, is taking on and off to, um, all the, all the microbial worlds that live on my skin and in my body, then I think um, I start to extend that 
that understanding to the, my immediate environment. And, and then I start to think, oh, I, you know, if this plastic bottle rolls down the hill and gets into the stream and breaks down there, it's going to come back to me. It's going to come back to haunt me. I mean, I think and that way we're still operating in self-interest. It's just that the self is an extended self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Another question is about how we are now living in the era where we've got people talking about fake news, fake science, fake history even. How do we navigate this language between truth or fake? And how do we not simply become cynical about any kinds of truth claims whatsoever? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, I found that in both Plutopia and um, Manual for Survival that, and we when you see this in a lot of books uh, of this ilk, is that there's a really strong um, and easy to do technique of just saying, "Oh, we don't know," you know, is is to is to cultivate uncertainty. We don't know that you know the jury is still out. You know what radiation does, low doses of radiation does to the body. Um, so this person who says that, that that they're sick, or this scientist who says they found something, um, we'll just create a rival study, or we'll just deny it. And so, you know, we do when we talk a lot about fake news. We you know we point at the other side. We point at you know the um, Tea Party or conservative media or QAnon, but. I hate to say it, but you know the academy and, and scientific expertise itself has a role to play that um, all kinds of um, industry lobbyists, uh, government agencies have peddled uncertainty um, as a way to avoid liability. Um, so I you know one one way I've tried to to, to, to correct that is to is to show a paper trail. That's what the story see, right? Show a paper trail. This is how they've been doing this. This is you know this is what determined. Absolute thing. So we can do that. We can sort of go to the sources of things. And if you're on the web, that means to keep clicking and keep clicking. Um, and the other thing we can do, I think, is to work with um, scientists and and be a part of that that creation of knowledge and see for ourselves what what makes sense. So I think we got time for for one last question. Uh, this one relates to the work that you've done on Chernobyl, which you know is a, a catastrophe on so many levels. How are people managing post Chernobyl living in that region? What what does that maybe teach us about us trying to live in a world where all of us are going to be affected by you know the the rise of CO two emissions, rising temperatures? You know we're we're having to learn to live in a world that is becoming less and less suited for the flourishing of any creaturely life. And Chernobyl just made a punctuation point about that. Are there things that you've learned from post Chernobyl people that you would say could be useful for folks of us thinking about living in an Anthropocene world? Yeah, well, that's why I went, uh, that's why I started this project is I thought, you know, the Anthropocene is upon us, um, potential catastrophe is upon us. And, you know, the experts, that's why I call it a manual for survival, the experts in survival are these people who've lived around these pretty good marshes because they've had everything thrown at them, you know, war, civil war, uh, famine, genocide, Holocaust, nuclear catastrophe. Um, so I thought if anybody knows how to survive, these people do. Um, and you know, I you know I found in the immediate aftermath of the accident just amazing people, these sort of everyday heroes who were like, I am not going to take this obfuscation and these silences um, as the end. And they went out and they figured out how to do their own citizen science, and they 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 made allies with people who were armed with Geiger counters and doctors and, and they got the information even though they weren't supposed to get it and they um, went around and spread the word. And so I find all kinds of you know, thousands of letters to, um, to government leaders saying, this is what's going on in our town. These are the numbers and this is what you should do to fix it. And so that sort of citizen advocacy, they had really good because they know their place. They had really good solutions for the problems they had, very practical and you know, pretty affordable solutions. So, um, and that way they, they really were good. But what I found, you know, fast forwarding, you know, to 2016 to 2018, when I was um, in these territories, 2014 to 18, is that it's it's depressing. It's depressing to live in a post, post-apocalyptic world. Um, they feel forgotten, they feel overlooked, they feel stigmatized. So whereas in the 1990s, all anybody could talk about was Chernobyl in 2000 and mid-2010s, that's the last thing anybody wanted to talk about was. Chernobyl, um, that there was a sort of a fatigue and exhaustion. 
and kind of a hopelessness. And the people who had choices, education, ability to, to sell their land and go somewhere else, they were gone. And the people with the fewest options are, are left behind. And, and that's a, I think we see that with our environmental justice issues today. Right. And the, the, the sad reality, of course, is that in an Anthropocene world, there are, will be no other places to escape to. So, Kate, thank you so much. This has been really, really wonderful. And I know we could have kept going for a long time, but we need to draw it to a close. So thanks so much for joining us. And to others, I just want to let you know that next week we will have Doug Kaiser, one of the deans at the Yale School of Law, joining us for what will be another really great conversation. So thank you, Kate. Thank you, participants. Thank you all for, for joining us. And I hope you have a good day.